tales, the big pictures. This is the story of the life of the Buddha, the Buddha's life. And of course, in India, it's not just one life, there's many lives. set off uh, and pursue uh, the life of a mendicant, wandering monk. Um, he is a prince, naturally. Princes always have ambitious fathers um, who don't want him to get, doesn't want him to go, and there's all sorts of complexities in the story. But anyway, one night he decides, well, I've had it, I'm just going to sneak off. So he sneaks off um, in, the, in the night and uh, goes into the forest, um, and the continuation of the story is told immediately below, um, where he dismounts from the horse, uh, sends the horse and his servant back to the palace, um, cuts off his hair, and renounces. So you get the sort of narrative and then sort of subplots and flow down. Yeah. And then all these things are, uh, the remainder of the sculptures are all uh, to do life. Um, they've been studied for many years, but there's still things that we don't really know to show how sort of fascinating it is when you, when you get into these details. This is um, what's represented here in this kind of middle register between these two ground rules, is a scene from the Buddha in a previous life in which he uh, uh, demonstrates the virtue of selflessness. Um, and so here's the uh, prince seated uh, in this incarnation who is called Shibi. Um, and the gods decide to give him a test, you know, that he declares he's going to be generous beyond all measure. And uh, the gods say, well, we'll see about that. And so uh, one of the gods takes the form of a bird catcher who's called bird, and he appears in the court and says, well, the king, you know, you've said you're selfless, um, you know, we mortgage this, this bird that I've caught, which is otherwise going to be sold for a carry or something. Um, and <laughs> the king says, of course, and so the bird catcher calls his bluff and says, well, it will be your weight, you know, in flesh for the bird, please. And there's the scales that have brought out. And there's another representation of this in the main tower as well, so a bit clearer. Uh, it's quite a well-known story, and the Buddha sort of starts chopping off parts of his body and you see a guest already, what's going to happen the group sort of starts getting heavier and heavier and heavier, uh, miraculously. So the king, and there we see him sort of kneeling down about to chop a bit of flesh off of his leg, um, he has to basically um, be willing to sacrifice his life for a bird. Um, and of course this is anticipating uh, Mahayana ideas of compassion of the Bodhisattva. Of 
course, once he's shown that he's got the capacity of, of uh, selflessness, uh, the God restores him uh, completely and then goes up to heaven. And, and there again you see the God ascending up to his heaven and slightly different but the same convention of the, of the clouds. Now the interesting thing about this story uh, is it only survives in Chinese and Tibetan texts. Uh, in India, it's disappeared. And in the birth stories of the Buddha, which are preserved in Sri Lanka, Thailand, and other Buddhist countries, this story is dropped out. Um, it's just not the way the texts have been transmitted. Now if this sculpture didn't survive, you'd say, well, actually, it was never in South India. That's why down in Sri Lanka they didn't have it. But this proves. Um, that the text was known in uh, South India, and therefore it was a curious thing that it didn't actually survive in India. So we, know, we can recognize this story rather strangely only because we have it in Tibetan and Chinese. So the Buddha's feet, the wheel, the tree, uh, all these symbols are retained, and yet the image is added. And the best sculpture to show the sort of emergence of the image uh, and the development of the Buddhist imagery as, as we know it today is the piece over there that the meaning of the sculpture over there. Which would have been stuck against the stupa like those panels there and placed on the stupa. And uh, again, because we're so many, you'll have to take turns just looking at it. Um, and what's ha why this is displayed like this, it, it would have never been originally like this at all. Um, what's happened here is this was carved at a very early period, then it was taken off the monument, turned over, flipped over, and recarved on the other side, and stuck up against the monument. So the sculpture that's on this side, um, which is very early, it's like 150 BC or thereabouts, you'll see, uh, those who can see will see, and those who will see will see, um, <laughs> that we've got the Bodhi tree, the tree where the Buddha sat for his great last meditation, and there's no Buddha. The, th the throne is empty. And the Buddha's presence is indicated by his little feet just sort of indicating that he's there. Um, and the great symbol of, in early Buddhism, are, are the footprints, as I mentioned before, but the Bodhi tree is also a, very, a big favorite. And the tree, of course, in its much later descendant, uh, survives in, in India at the at the place, and saplings from that tree have been taken to many parts of the Buddhist world, and particularly famous episode in the third century BC when a small sapling of the, of the original tree was taken to Sri Lanka, where in fact it's still growing. And if you go there, there's sort of a big barricade, you can't really get in, you can barely see the, what's supposed to be the branch of the original tree that was brought there in the third century BC. But in the courtyard all around, there's dozens of little saplings all shooting up. Um, and you could probably, well, they do take them and then they've taken them from there to even other places. So you have this kind of um, living genetic descendant uh, that goes right back to, you know, four or 500 BC, uh, which is the link to the Buddha. general themes of Buddhism are explored uh, in, in the main gallery. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.